Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Tom McClammy, Dr. Tom McClammy. I practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've been practicing here for the last nine years. Prior to that time, I practiced in Bend, Oregon. Uh, prior to that time, I attended Boston University under uh, the director of Dr. Herb Schilder, who is no longer with us. Uh, however, I practiced previous to my endodontic residency in the Willamette Valley of Oregon for 15 years, and then I got the insatiable endo bug and decided to sell my practice. I actually sold two practices in 92 and then 96, and then enrolled at Boston University, fortunate to get accepted there, and learned uh, the direction of endodontics uh, from what I would refer to as the father of, of modern-day endodontics, Dr. Herb Schilder. I feel like that is an incredible privilege to have trained with that individual and really, literally practiced side by side uh, in his private office with him, as well as attended the university program. I did the, the three-year program and did the master's program. And then I went back and practiced in Oregon for five years, and then in search of the sun came to Scottsdale. This evening I'd like to share with you some information that's really an entire hybrid of information and a composite of information of more than 40 years of dentistry. It has been said, and I'll repeat the statement, I'm not going to take credit for it, but who you are is where you were when. And here I am practicing in 2013 in sunny Scottsdale. And what I'm doing today is a composite of what I've learned over the last 30 plus years of clinical dentistry. And I'm happy with the results that I'm getting and I feel like I'm practicing the best dentistry and the best endodontics that I ever have in my career. And tonight my, my objective is to share with you some of the ways that I'm able to do that today as a wet glove endodontist. So with that, I want to congratulate you for being here this evening. All of us, including myself, have had a long, busy day of practice. I've been in my office personally since before 6 this morning. I come in my office early, and I shower and shave at my office and go through my emails, and then I get ready to treat my patients. So let's get on with it, but thanks for being here. I promise you that it will be worthwhile because you'll see some nuances. I'm going to move ahead here. And uh, I think one of the reasons that some of us get involved in endodontics is because when we're done with, the, with our obturation and we take our final image, whether it be a conventional uh, image or whether it's a digital image that we can display on a computer screen, hopefully in front of our patients so the patients can experience it, I truly, truly get so excited. Sometimes I feel myself, the adrenaline is going, and sometimes I literally feel myself shaking because I'm so excited to see and experience what I'll refer to as the thrill of the fill. Years ago, I asked one of my colleagues, happened to be a female, ended on us, what got you excited about going to endo school? Why did you as a dentist go back to endo school? And she said, you know, on the cover of Dentistry Today, I saw these images that were posted on there by people like Cliff Ruddle and Steve Buchanan, and she said, I got so excited about the anatomy. I cannot explain to you what there is about an obturated root canal system that gets me excited, except that it's something that nature has produced. Nature seldom makes a straight line. Nature never makes two of the same. And we never know what we're going to get. Tonight, I hope to be able to communicate some ideas with you and share with you some ideas and perhaps some techniques that will help you experience and help all of us experience on a regular basis, a daily basis, and hopefully multiple times a day, what I'm going to refer to as the thrill of the fill. Most of us realize that our, our, our difficulty here in experiencing this is we're dealing with some very, very complex root canal anatomy. And 
this is a little animation of a slide that was shared with, with me by Ben Johnson and also Sergio Cutler. I know that's where it came from, down in, in Florida. But it lets us see in a 3D animation in a microcomputed uh, a computer screen and, 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 and a vivid illustration in 3D the complexity of the root canal system. This is just a section of a root, but it lets us realize what we're dealing with. In dental school, I've got to say I'm really sorry, but nobody really used the term root canal system. And had I known that early on, I probably would approach things significantly differently. With that in mind, how do we capture, how do we capture that intricate, that complex root canal system anatomy? And I hope this evening to be able to share with you some of that information. What we're seeing here on the screen now is an illustration of, again, uh, courtesy of Sergio Cutler. Dr. Cutler down in Florida is in the process of doing this research and showing taking the mesial root of lower first and second molars and illustrating with micro CT analysis the complex root canal system anatomy in those mesial roots of the lower, lower molars. And if you look from the left and to the right, you'll see that many of these root canals, while they look relatively simple on a two-dimensional radiograph, when we start visualizing and looking at these molars with this 3D animation and micro CT analysis, we realize that we're not dealing with a simple white line on a radiograph. We're not dealing with a simple two light white lines on a radiograph. But rather, and I really want to enforce or, or stress that we're talking about root canal systems. And many of these systems here in this mesial root of the lower molars not only have a mesial lingual root and a mesial lingual canal, but they also have a mesial buccal canal. And in addition to that, there's oftentimes an anastomosis between those. And there's many times, and we've coined the frame, phrase or the terminology, a mesial root. And then we've also talked about the middle mesial canal. Well, you know. That's true, and many of these systems do have a middle mesial canal. However, it's really a root canal system, and sometimes we think there's three canals, but really there's multiple canals and multiple systems that communicate with one another, and we need to realize that when we go in and work with them. Here's another animation by a very well-known uh, lecturer and teacher, one of the one of the best teachers on the planet of clinical endodontics, and that'd be Cliff Ruddle. He shared this little video with me and given me permission to share it with others. And it shows an animation of what we're dealing with on a lower, a typical lower molar. It's not just a simple root canal. I'm going to move ahead here. And the first thing that I want to share with you as far as a video clip, I want to give you a little sneak preview of, quote, coming attractions. And what we're going to show here is a little animation of taking an upper central incisor and obturating that root canal system and showing the simplicity of using an instrument that's available in the marketplace today. We're taking the calamus flow side of the calamus dual instrument, and we're obturating the root canal system. The first part of that that you see is placing the calamus cartridge in the root canal system and extruding a little bit of warm gut percha, and then instantaneously being able to follow up and use a calamus plugger and condense that warm gut percha apically, shepherding, carefully shepherding the warm gutta percha and the sealer off the root canal system walls and condensing it vertically. And by doing so, we're capturing the maximum amount of anatomy in that root canal system, provided that we have shaped it and cleaned it well. So we're going to talk about all of those things in this particular 
uh, webinar this evening. So you can move on to the next slide here. I, I alluded a little bit early to, or I made reference to something in dental school. And when I was in dental school, uh, back in the very early, late 70s and early 80s, I had never personally heard of, of Herb Schilder before. And I had never heard the term root canal system anatomy. I remember sitting down with the director of the endodontic program there, F. James Marshall, who was a great educator, wonderful guy, a little bit on the gruff side at times, but I got along with him really well. And I remember in one of my interviews with him, sitting in his private office, and I asked him specifically, Dr. Marshall, what is it that we're trying to do with endodontics? What is it we're trying to do with root canals? And you know, I don't remember ever getting a really good answer to that question. Had he said to me at that time, because this information was known, well, you know, I would suggest that you read Dental Clinics of North America because there's a guy named Herb Schilder out in Boston, and he's written an article, and in that article, he outlines five mechanical objectives. Some of the other educators since that time have taken those five mechanical objectives and kind of condensed those objectives down to four. So when I'm doing clinical endodontics, there's four primary things mechanically that I'm trying to do. I apologize for reading a slide, but I think each one of these things, however simple they may be, really capture what we're trying to do clinically. The first thing that we're trying to do is create, after we have an ideal access cavity, we're trying to create in that root canal, and more specifically in that root canal system, a continuous tapering preparation. So from the orifice of the root canal to the terminus, we're trying to create a continuous tapering funnel or a continuous tapering preparation, if you will. I will admit that most of the time and some of the time, nature has given us that. But sometimes we need to shape it, and obviously we need to clean it. Second thing what we're trying to do is we're trying to maintain all of the original anatomy of the root canal system. We really don't want to change it significantly. And sometimes there are some teeth that if we could just remove the pulp from the entire root canal system, our work would be done. We could, if we could remove that tissue and then we could disinfect that space, we could simply obturate it. Regardless, we want to maintain the original anatomy of the root canal system. Another critical component of these mechanical objectives is to maintain the position of the apical foramen. I will admit that sometimes the apical foramen is really not on the very apex of the tooth. It can be off to the side. There can be multiple portals of exit. You can even refer to them as portals of entry because there are things that are entering into the root canal system and there are things that are exiting. But as far as our mechanical objectives go, we want to maintain the position of that apical foramen. In other words, we don't want to transport, we don't want to zip, we don't want to move that apical foramen. And then one more thing that is absolutely paramount, we want to maintain the position, pardon me, we want to keep the foramen as small as practical. I really believe that a lot of clinicians today and sometimes myself, open up the foramen larger than we need to make it. I like to refer to that small apical one-third of the root canal system as sacred territory. And I like to sneak up on the apical foramen, and I like to keep it as small as practical. If we look at some of, those, some of the research, sometimes that apical foramen and that apical constriction is as small as 0 0.20. So we want to keep it as small as practical, and that's important as we operate these root canal systems in the way that I'm going to illustrate this evening. We might say that there's a triad for endodontic success, and it comprises three things. Instrumentation, and our instrumentation can be referred to as all of the things that we do to mechanically shape the root canal system from 
our initial access after we have good rubber dam access, isolation. Once we have ideal coronal access, then we want to get our radicular access. And that can be done in a myriad of different ways, whether it be hand files, whether it be, oh my gosh, we're going to use gates glidens. That's a whole other topic of discussion, but whether we choose to use a rotary instrument like a gates glidden, or whether we're using all hand files, whether we're going to use reamers, whether we're going to use hedge files, whether we are going to go in and advance and use nickel titanium rotary files or some other metallurgy. We're talking about all the mechanical instrumentation of being able to, quote, shape the root canal system. Another part of this success triad would be our irrigants. We need to realize that our instruments shape and our irrigants clean. Our instruments allow us to create the space necessary so that our irrigants can get into and digest the system in its entirety. The better the shape that we have, the better we're able to deliver our irrigants into the complex anatomy of the root canal system so that we can then go to the third part of the triad, and that would be obturating. Bottom line is, the system must be clean. One of my favorite lines that uh, I refer to and think about on a regular basis is the value of continuing education. And today, I think the professional has no right other than to be a continuous student. I know that one of the things that has kept me alive, has kept me interested, has kept me engaged, has kept me excited about going to work every day, I refer to it as work, but it's actually going to play every day, and that is I've been a continuous student. I'm enrolled on a regular basis in some heavy-duty, sometimes rather expensive, continuing education courses internationally, and I'm proud of it. I'm happy. I get stimulated. I get motivated. I learn new things, and I go back, and I get to come to the office every day and play the game. So back to this, we must have, back to the root canal systems, we must have an ideal shape that we have created and nature has created. We must have an ideal access cavity, and then we must have ideal debridement and disinfection. And the bottom line is the system must be clean. If that system is not clean and all of the tissue is not out of the root canal system, we can't possibly capture the anatomy that allows us to experience the thrill of the fill. I want to talk for just a few moments about the instruments that I'm using and have been using for well over a decade. These instruments were developed by uh, some of my close pals with uh, John West, uh, Pierre Machu, Cliff Ruddle. And when these first instruments were first introduced to me, I started using them, and I called up Cliff Ruddle, and I told him that I think that he had created nickel titanium nirvana. And Cliff, for a moment, took a second step back, and he said, McClammy, are you using one of those words that I don't understand, like that time that you were talking to me about working in a a microscope, and you were referring to me as spelunking? And I said, Cliff, do you not know what nirvana means? And he said, no, I don't. I said, well, would you please go talk to Phyllis? I thought that Cliff had created nickel titanium nirvana. And then about the third or fourth case, Dr. McClammy separated one of these files, and I was devastated. These files are used differently than conventional nickel titanium rotary instrumentation. I spent many hours listening and reading and studying to the point where I became very, very proficient using pro taper instruments. I love these things. Today, there are a plethora of rotary files in the marketplace, so much so that it can be very confusing to the end user. It can be very confusing to the clinician. Today, now we even have pro taper nets, which really doesn't have any relationship except by name to quote pro tapers, but they're also another very interesting, very novel, very 
effective instruments for shaping the root canal system. Enough said. We all have our favorites. These happen to be favorites of mine, but there's great stuff in the marketplace. Something that we need to illustrate or I need to illustrate is the importance of passive irrigation versus active irrigation. Passive irrigation to me is placing sodium hypochlorite in the root canal system or some other irrigant of choice and simply letting it sit there. What I want to illustrate is the importance of changing that solution from using it in a passive form to an active form. There's all kinds of things in the marketplace today to do that. There's all kinds of irrigants. The thing that I want to communicate is that we no longer can depend upon passive irrigation. Simply extruding an irrigant into the root canal system, whether we've shaped it or not, we need to not only introduce that irrigate into the root canal system, but we need to change its form from being simply passive, just sitting there, active, and then we need to exchange that irrigant. Me personally, what I'm doing in my regular everyday practice, every day, multiple times a day, multiple exchanges, I'm using heated sodium hypochlorite. I'm exchanging that with EDTA. And then my final irrigant of choice is Q-mix. But at the same time, and concomitantly, and not necessarily just at the end, I'm using something that's simple, something that's very reasonable in terms of expense, something that doesn't have any learning curve or so, such a short learning curve, it's not even mentionable, but something that's also very safe and something that we use every day, multiple times a day, multiple times in the root canal system, whether it be a retreatment or an initial treatment, and that's the endoactivator. This is not a webinar about the endoactivator, but it is, a, it is a webinar, and it is an illustration in a slide share series illustrating, well, how do you, McClam, get the shapes that you're getting? How do you capture its complex anatomy? And the way we do that, and the way that I do that, one of the ways is using Active irrigation versus passive. In other words, I'm activating my irrigants on a regular basis, and I think about it all the time. Another thing that I use that I think is an absolute must-have is an instrument that goes on the DCI three-way syringe, and it's referred to as the Straco irrigator. I started using this many years ago as a general dentist. It was introduced to me through endodontics. But I found that this was an absolute, unreplaceable instrument, and I use it whether it be conventional endodontics, whether it be surgical endodontics, whether it be the implant part of my practice, I use this on a regular basis. And me personally, a few years ago, John Strocko introduced me to the longer version of the Strocko irrigator versus the shorter version, and personally, in my hands, I like it better. I absolutely love this thing. And I never let a lecture go by that I don't illustrate its importance because to me, it's about vision, it's about seeing, it's about confidence, and it's about doing all the little things that lead up to and allow me to experience on a regular basis what I'm going to again refer to as the thrill of the fill. I know there's some clinicians that don't use an apex locator on a regular basis. I want to tell you that I use my apex locator. I specifically use the J. Marita uh, apex locator illustrated here, the Root ZX. I use this on every single canal multiple times in multiple ways with extreme effectiveness and accuracy. There are other ways that I determine the location of the apical foramen, whether it be tactile sensation, whether it be on occasion a paper point, whether it be what's illustrated on my digital radiograph, whether it be my intuition about how long I think the root canal system. There's lots of things that I use, but when it's possible, which is almost every single case, there are a few times on a retreatment that we can't use it, but those are very rare, or a case that's been treated surgically, it's obviously not going to work. Or if there's a place where there's a resorption defect in a case, it's not going to work. But I use this instrument every single time. One of the nuances I want to point out is instead of using 
the clip on the Root ZX. I prefer the probe. I'm not going to go into specific reasons why, except to say that the probe allows me to simply touch my hand file or even my rotary file, which I'll illustrate here in just a moment in the video, but it allows me to slide my stopper up and down and go to my reproducible reference point, and it's extremely effective. Every canal, multiple times, make sure that you understand how to use it. Tonight we're going to also talk about, and really the purpose of the webinar is to talk about an instrument that I'm using for operating the root canal system. And these are some of the things that I've used in the past. I've used them. I like them. But I'm using something now and have for a number of years, this is not new, that I like and I like better than all the things that are illustrated here and all the other things in the marketplace. We all have our favorites and I have mine. So what I want to illustrate or introduce to you is something that we're going to refer to as the calamus, the calamus and specifically the calamus dual. And in this slide that you're seeing now to the left is what's called the calamus pack. In the center is the calamus dual. And on the right part of the slide is the calamus flow. Instruments now are available in a single instrument that's right in the center. And on the left side of that center, and we're going to go into this and how it functions here in just a few minutes, is the what's called the calamus dual. I think that we're going to be able to do that right here and now. So we're going to pull up a little video to, to show uh, a little animation here on the screen. And the first thing we want to do with this thing, it looks complex. It looks like a, hold on here, don't push any buttons on me, my friend. What I want to do here is look at this and realize there's a whole bunch of things on this screen that's kind of like getting in the, in the cockpit of an airplane. You see all this stuff and it's confusing. But if we sort it out piece by piece, it's not confusing. Center of the screen, down in the bottom on the dashboard, we'll call it, you push that button and that turns the calamus dual on. And it's specifically turning on the left side. And on the left side, and piece is what we refer to as calamus pack. That calamus pack does a number of different things. But if you look down and you look on the LED screen, there is a printout of the temperature. And then if we push the actual centigrade temperature, we can then raise the temperature or we can lower the temperature. And that's done based upon the preference of the clinician. If you like your gut perch a little bit warmer, obviously you can turn that up. I can't remember if it goes up in 10 degrees at a time or 20 degrees. I guess 10 degrees at a time. And it goes all the way up to 400 and it goes down to as low as I believe 100 or 60 or something. The temperature is not that important. You do what works for you and how you like the consistency of your gut percha. The hand piece on the left, again, we're going to slip over there and point that out. There's a couple of things that I'd really like to point out on this. On the top of it is the heat plugger tip. Just below the heat plugger tip is a blue ring that goes all the way around the hand piece. And that blue ring is important because you can touch that 360 degrees all the way around that and activate. And when you touch it with your finger, even with your gloves on, it activates the heat plugger tip on the end. I might point out that there are three different sizes. This won't be the only time that I'll point this out, but there's three different sizes of the heat plugger tips. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. The other thing that that calamus pack does on the left side there of the calamus dual is that there's another tip that goes on there that sits on the end of that that I showed a little bit previously. And what that instrument does is allows us to do a vitality test on teeth, how many times do we have patients that come in and they ask us or they tell us, hey, you know what, Doc? The cold doesn't bother my tooth, but heat does. There's different ways to test teeth to heat, but this is a great way to test it. You can put on the, the heat testing tip and test pulp type vitality by putting some heat to the tooth. Very effective, very easy to use. I'm going to now move over to the right side hand piece and the right side hand piece. Again, we've got to activate it, so we've got to, we've got to touch that. 
we've got to touch the temperature gauge, and that goes up, that goes from like 160 to 200 degrees centigrade. It goes up in 10 degrees at a time. The temperature that you set on that instrument, on that calamus flow on the right side here, is based upon the preference of the consistency of the gutta percha that can only be determined by the clinician. It's how warm do you want your gutta percha, how do you want it to flow, how does it feel when you condense that gutta percha in your root canal system with the calamus pluggers. So we can touch that temperature gauge, and then we can raise it and lower it. You can see the little blue light that comes on in the upper right part of the screen that indicates that the calamus flow is on. You need to realize that these two instruments, while we turn the system on with one button down in the center, they can simultaneously be used and be heated, which is a very important thing because when we're operating the root canal system, you don't want to have to wait to heat up the flow side. And you'll get an illustration of that here in just a little bit. So I think we can move on here. Please don't be confused here. This is not a complex instrument. It's very simple. The last thing I'd like to point out, again, there's a blue ring on the calamus flow handpiece. And when we touch that blue ring, 360 degrees all the way around it, we can extrude gutta percha out of the cartridge chip by touching that ring. And the flow rate can also be adjusted by the little button in the center on the right. You can adjust how quickly that plunger extrudes gutta percha out of the calamus flow handpiece. Really, really effective. The reason that I, I want to say one more thing here. The reason that I went to the calamus instrument versus, say, the most commonly used thing probably in warm gutta percha delivery device today, which would be the former uh, Spartan Aptura unit, the Aptura gun, is because in the early 90s, I changed from doing gutta percha with the naked eye and with loops, and I went to obturating my root canal systems with a microscope, and I found the need for a smaller instrument. And I, and I really, really wish that somebody would develop an instrument that was smaller and more ergonomic to deliver it to the places that we're delivering it on a regular basis inside the oral cavity in a way that was safe and more ergonomic than some of the things that are in the marketplace today. So I'm going to move ahead here, and I think we might have some, uh, some little video clips to show. And the video clip on the top here, the top of the screen, is a little video that shows uh, what's happening in the treatment room. So we're going we're gonna to move ahead here, and it's, and it's showing here we're operating a root canal system. I'm tapping my patient on the shoulder and letting him know that he may feel just a little bit of heat there. My assistant is completely dialed in and understands exactly what I'm doing. Sometimes she can watch into the microscope on her side with the binoculars. But we're so used to doing this together, she so understands what I'm doing that I need not even look out of the microscope and she's handing me the, the calamus plat pack. I'm searing off the gutta percha at orifice level and then I'm taking a calamus slugger and I'm condensing it vertically. She is wiping that calamus heat tip, the pack tip off, cleaning it off. She just inadvertently pulled the, the little plugger out of there, the heat plugger, but she's handing me the things as necessary. I don't even need to get out of the microscope. I referred earlier to the three sizes of heat plugger tips that go on the calamus pack side of the calamus dual. I'll talk a little bit more about those later. There are four different sizes of silicone handled calamus pluggers. That's what you see illustrated up there on the top. I want to pull up for just a moment slide 19 in the lower left part of the screen. And in that slide, it's showing changing that heat plugger tip. The one that I'm using most of the time on almost all systems is the black one. And it's the smallest one. There's a black one, there's a yellow one, and there's a blue one. This one's the largest. I'd like now to move to the next slide. And I want to illustrate again 
on average, how many times? Let's see slide number 20. How many times do you have to hear something before you really get it? This instrument was designed and redesigned and used and prototyped and used. Any place that you touch that blue ring, 360 degrees, no matter where you are in the mouth and the oral cavity delivering this and making it work, you can touch that and activate that heat plugger tip. Really, really important. So let's move ahead here with this. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I think I'm being a little bit too wordy with all of this. But let's go ahead to our, to our next. Real quick, Dr. McClamey, I hope you don't mind me jumping in. Um, let's try moving your earbuds, um, the microphone back around front, if you don't mind. We're getting just a little bit of scraping, I think, um, with, with it dangling behind. So if we could have you maybe change your positioning of your earbuds so that speaker or microphone would be more in front. OK. You know what? I, just let me, let me flip this around. Pardon me. Yeah. And maybe no problem. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, my, my microphone probably wasn't in the most ideal position, but it should be better now. Are you better now? Absolutely. Let's okay. carry on. Let's move ahead here. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So the top video here I want to show, um, I, I talked about a little bit earlier the importance of not only using an apex locator, but how I use it. And I also talked about just for a moment using it both on a, I'm going to go ahead and start this video clip. I talked about using it both on a hand file and on a rotary file. So here's my point. I can put that in with the, with the apex locator tip wand type of thing versus the little clip. I can simply touch that file and then I can slide my, I can slide my stopper down to get a, a better uh, illustration of where that reference point is. Here I'm actually got a, a fairly large pro taper in this system because this is a fairly large root canal system I rarely use. That's actually an F123. Uh, I believe that's an F3. And that's a pretty large instrument for me to use. But in this particular case, this could have been a retreat. It was a fairly large. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm doing here. I'm fitting a cone into the root canal system. And I'm kind of gauging the size of the apical foramen. In this particular case, I believe our root canal uh, length was somewhere in the 17.7. 17, 17 I like to measure my root canal length and my root canal system length to the nearest tenth of a millimeter. I know that I'm not that accurate, but that's what I'm shooting for. So the more I try to shoot for accuracy, the better I get it. In this particular case, I'm fitting a calamus and a, 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 a pack heat plugger tip in here. Because this system is so large, I've actually decided to use the blue one, which I don't very rarely do but I'm doing so in this illustration because it's a large system. That has five millimeter increments marked on there, which are really helpful. I know when you take all this stuff in as you're doing the, the, the case, and I know that with those five millimeters and I'm at 17.7, I know exactly where that heat plugger tip needs to go. I'm trying to get it within about three to five millimeters of the apical foramen. Here's an illustration of placing sealer on my master cone. I like to put the sealer over to the edge of the pad so that I can simply roll my gutta percha cone in that sealer and get it 360 degrees all the way around the gutta percha cone. And then I carefully tease that master cone to place with my sealer on it. I'm using, in this particular case, Kerr Extended Working Time Sealer. That's my sealer of choice. You see the little animation in the upper left screen. Depending upon the complexity or my perceived understanding of the complexity of the system, I may use a little gutta percha cone to place my sealer inside the, the root canal system and then use the master cone that I've pre-fit. Here I'm going to show placing an additional cone Right alongside that, this is not lateral con condensation. This is going to be warm vertical condensation canal. And what I'm doing here is taking the calamus heat, 
the calamus pack tip and see that got a perch off right at orifice level. Are you still with me, John? You probably don't know. I'm going to go now down to the second video down here on the bottom, which is a continuation of the video that was on the top. It's a little bit of a repeat, and I'm I'm searing that gutta percha off at orifice level, and then I'm going to instantaneously take a calamus plugger, and I'm going to condense that gutta percha vertically. I'm condensing the sealer along with it. I'm shepherding off the walls of the access cavity. There you see illustrated the four different sizes of the calamus pluggers. These have really nice, they feel good in your hands because they've got a silicone handle. I'm going to now take the calamus pack heat tip, and I'm going to remove an aliquot of gutta percha out of the root canal system, maybe two to three millimeters, maybe four millimeters, and that I have warmed that gutta percha in the root canal system, and then I'm going to immediately go back to a calamus plugger, and I'm going to condense it vertically, shepherding off the walls, getting the sealer, moving it, and moving that warm gutta percha apically, and trying to capture as much anatomy as I possibly can. I'm actually visually thinking about capturing the root canal system anatomy as I do it. I'm moving down the root canal system or up the root canal system, however you want to say it, but I'm moving apically, and as I do so, I'm taking the calamus pack, I'm removing a small aliquot of gutta percha, two, three millimeters, and then immediately I'm capturing that gutta percha, which is very warm, and condensing it vertically, capturing as much anatomy as I possibly can, keeping in mind I'm doing this all the time in the microscope. My assistant knows what I'm doing. She can see what I'm doing both on a video monitor and also in the assistant's binoculars on the other side of the microscope. Gives you tremendous confidence and it creates the value and allows me to experience regularly what I'm going to call the thrill of the fill. In this additional video that we're going to show, we're going to show the same process, but we're going to see it in the mesial canals of a lower molar. There I'm removing a little bit out of the mesial lingual canal of the lower molar. The exact same process. I'm removing a small aliquot of gutta percha. I'm taking a small calamus plugger, I'm condensing it vertically, I'm removing that stuff from the access cavity so I can see better. The better I can see it, the better I can do it. The better I do it, the better I feel about myself. And the better I can do my job, which makes me feel fantastic about the results that I'm getting. The other thing I'd like to illustrate here briefly, you'll see the size of the small Zerk mirror that I'm using. This is actually a size zero removing a small amount of gutta percha, jumping on that. You see I was going to use a, a too large of a plugger, so I'm going to, now I'm going to go to a smaller plugger, and I'm going to condense. This is the smallest calamus plugger that's available. I'm going to 0.5 millimeters at the tip. I'm condensing that gutta percha vertically. I like to use these small mirrors back in difficult access areas. I don't need to see a lot. I just need to see right where I'm working. I'd like to refer now for a moment, this is redundant, but it's important, slide number 22. These are the calamus heat tips, calamus heat pluggers that go on the top of the calamus uh, pack on the left-hand side of the dual. There are three different sizes that I alluded to and referenced earlier, but the one that Tom McClammy uses most of the time in almost all systems, and as you understand and get efficient and effective and comfortable and confident with the delivery of vertically condensed warm gutta percha, you'll find that you can obturate almost any system with the smallest size tip that's available. And for me, that's the, the 4003. I'm going to move now to the next slide, which probably is slide number 23, 24. And I want to illustrate here the different accessories that are available on the Calamus Dual. On the left-hand side of the screen, those are the three different size pluggers that go on the heat part. In the center of the screen is a little uh, shield that can go around the flow, the calamus flow. I haven't 
I haven't really found that I needed to use that on a regular basis. I know my partner, Dr. Anderson, uses it, but I haven't found that the heat generated on the calamus flow was ever a problem. And I'm very in control of what I'm doing. Obviously, I have a rubber dam on. I very rarely ever have a patient complain, but that's available. There on the, a little bit more to the lower left of the screen, there's the little blue tip that goes on top of the calamus flow. There's a little bending instrument that helps us. We don't need it all the time. I'm going to show it in a little video animation a little bit later in the, in the webinar. But that helps us to bend that calamus cartridge at the end. There's a little cleaning brush that is helpful. But one of the things that I like about using the calamus is that the maintenance on it is minimal. It's minimal compared to some of the other instruments that are in the marketplace today for obturation. And then let's move over to the right side of the screen. The calamus cartridges come in three different sizes, and they come in a 10-pack, and they're meant for single use. So your assistant prior to the case can place a cartridge into the calamus flow, and then at the end of that treatment, after you've operated that system, that can be removed, and the next cartridge can fit in there. I'm going to talk about the sizes of the calamus uh, cartridges here in a moment. But having done that, let's move ahead here. Uh, I think up here in the, we're going to do that right now, in fact. Uh, in, the, in the upper video here that we want to show, it shows after we have done our removal of gutta percha in this technique, we're going to actually now backfill the technique. We're bending the tip here of the calamus flow. I use this instrument some of the time. I don't need to use it all of the time. I have found that these tips are tough enough and resilient enough that I can bend them with my fingers even when they're heated, and it has never been a problem for me. However, it's nice to have as a backup, and those, when you, especially when you're getting used to bending those, to be able to use it with the bending tip. You saw me extruding just a little bit of gutta percha out of the end of it. When you load the cartridge, the cartridge needs to heat up to full temperature, and then you need to press that blue ring. And as you press the, press the blue ring, that plunger goes down into the cartridge and starts to extrude that got a percha out of the end of the cartridge. I specifically want to place warm gutta percha against warm gutta percha. So as I have a little bit of gutta percha in the apical part of the root canal system that I've obturated, say in the apical one-third, that three to five millimeters, ideally I want to place the end of the calamus cartridge that's warm against that gutta percha I want to heat that up just slightly, and then I want to touch that blue ring, and I want to extrude a small amount of gutta percha. I'm going to say one, two millimeters, and then instantaneously jump on that warm gutta percha with my calamus plugger that my assistant hands me. She understands what I need. She can see what I need, hands it to me very efficiently. I don't have to look out of the microscope. She hands me the plugger. I condense it. And then concomitantly, when I'm done, I simply roll my hand, a little hand signal that she understands, and she can hand me the calamus flow back. I can extrude another aliquotic warm gutta percha and then condense it vertically. And we backpack the entire root canal system that way, capturing as much anatomy as is humanly possible. I'd like to refer for a moment here to the cartridge sizes, which is on the upper right slide, there are three different sizes of calamus cartridges. There's a 20 gauge, a 23 gauge, and a 25 gauge. The 20 gauge is the largest, the 23 is a medium, and the 25 is much smaller. I think they're making some improvements in the 25 gauge. It's a little bit small. It's a great little instrument. But for me, Dr. Clammy uses the 23 gauge on almost all root canal systems. I have found that that's the most efficient, the toughest one, and it's the one I use on almost all systems. 
I referred earlier to, and if I can look at the center slide with the little red uh, slide number 30 there, we no longer have to deal with, with pellets of gutta percha. That one of the things in a list of things that I like about the calamus tool and the calamus flow is that the cartridges are contained inside that, pardon me, the gutta percha is contained inside the calamus cartridge. So there's no gutta percha flowing inside the unit that tends to gum it up and you've got to mess with it. You've got to clean it. Don't have that problem. In this slide that I'm illustrating here, there's a little window on the side of the calamus flow. And once the, the temperature of the gutta percha is up to your preset temperature, you can push that blue ring. And as you push that blue ring, again, anywhere 360 around it, that small pink spot inside the window moves up. And as it moves up, it pushes the gutta percha outside and out the end of the cartridge. So very handy. Allows you to see how much of that cartridge you have remaining for a given operation of a system. And the other two slides here in the efforts of conserving some time, let's just realize that as we push that blue ring, we're extruding gutta percha outside. We need to heat the gutta percha up to the predetermined temperature. Then we push the blue ring and wait for that gutta percha to be expressed outside of the calamus cartridge. And I, I do that outside the patient, outside the tooth, so that I don't have to wonder, well, when is my gutta percha going to show up? So I extrude a little bit, then I go right to my root canal system, and I place that warm cartridge tip against the last part of the root canal, pardon me, the last part of the gutta percha that's in the root canal system, so that I'm extruding and placing warm gutta percha against warm gutta percha and then condensing it. Let's move on with the rest of this here. There's a couple of more videos that we have to play. Congratulations for staying with me. I'm going to go to the, to the video on the top. This is a continuation of the one that we saw as a sneak preview in the beginning. The animation in the upper, in the upper left shows extrusion of a small aliquotic gutta percha, two, three millimeters inside the root canal system. And then we are placing a calamus plugger against that gutta percha condensing it vertically. We got warm to warm gutta percha. We're using the appropriate size calamus plugger. We're shepherding the gutta percha off the canal walls in addition to any sealer, capturing the maximum amount of anatomy. As we move to a larger cross-sectional diameter of the root canal system, we then need to go to capture the maximum amount of rubber. We need to go to a larger size plugger. So as your assistant understands this, and as she or he can see it, they can hand you the appropriate size plugger. Here we're backfilling again. Another small aliquot of gutta percha gets placed into the root canal system. And then again, the plugger goes right on top of it while we're condensing warm to warm. I personally like to place small aliquots of gutta percha at a time and then condense it vertically so that number one, I have less voids, number two, I have less shrinkage, and number three, I can experience the thrill of the th fill by knowing that I've captured all of that anatomy in the tooth that I possibly can, provided that I've shaped well and provided that I've cleaned well. It's predictable, it works, it works extremely well, and it makes you a happy guy at the end of the day. Let's now go down to the, to the video down in the bottom part of the screen. And this illustrates the exact same principles that I've been talking about during this entire webinar. Here is extruding gutta percha into a canal, the distal canal of a lower molar that is more of a ribbon shape. It's wide buccal lingually. Instead of, quote, there are no round canals, there are no straight canals. But it's an illustration of doing exactly the same thing placing that gutta percha inside the root canal system, watching with a small mirror in your microscope, just in the area that you need to see it, taking the appropriate size plugger, 
shepherding the gutta percha off the root canal walls and condensing it ver vertically. There's the mesial canals. There's a larger size plugger coming into the field and capturing the maximum amount of rubber and condensing it vertically. There are people that say that, my gosh, with this technique, you can split or fracture roots. I think that that's done in very, can be done in very untrained hands. And I know that I've been given an occasion many, many, many years ago when I wasn't familiar and I was learning how to do the case, learning how to, to work with warm gutta percha. So I want to conclude the uh, webinar by showing some of the things and some of the cases that are some of my clinical favorites. And uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about each one. This is, a, this is a lower molar. This, while it doesn't look like it's that complex, the mesial lingual canal on this particular lower molar was extremely challenging. Without cone beam commuted tomography, I'm sure that I would have messed this case up because that lingual root, that distal lingual root, takes an abrupt turn about half to two-thirds of the way down the root canal system and is, and is curved, if we want to call it a curve, almost at 90 degrees. It's one of my personal favorites. It's one of my pals in Sarasota, Florida. He loves to look at this case and tells me how great it is every time. I can look at any case I've done and say, you know what? I could have done it a little bit better, and that's what comes, keeps us coming back for more. Here's an upper molar. Uh, you can see here that we're dealing with some very complex curvature, really in all three roots of the root canal system. Look at that palatal canal. Look at that white on white that illustrates portals of exit, or again, I might add portals of entry. But look at the curvature in the apical one-third. Look at the delicacy of the distal buccal root, and look at the curvature that's there, or I might say bend or turn about two-thirds of the way up the root canal system. And then notice what we refer to affectionately as the shoulder puff at the end, and keeping in mind the mechanical objectives and keeping in mind keeping that foramen as long as practical, pardon me, as small as practical. And then let's move over to the mesial buccal root and look at the degree of curvature. These systems were all shaped with pro taper instrumentation very carefully. Sometimes the rotary instrument was turned by hand, not in a rotary hand piece. They were all done with specific instruments on specific in emphasis on the mechanical objectives that I learned from Cliff Ruddle, but more specifically, they came from well-acknowledged Dr. Herbert Childer. I want to move on to the next system here. This is an illustration of what we're seeing in the lower molars. What I try to do is keep that original man anatomy maintained. I like to keep the foramen as small as practical, and I like to capture the original anatomy. That's what does it for me. Here's a personal favorite of mine. This happens to be one of my very best referring dentists. He practices across the hall from me. I've showed this slide in different venues, and I've had people in the audience say to me, you know, McClammy, you're pretty good at Photoshop. I can tell you that this is exactly the way this root canal system is today. I'm happy with this. I spent time with this. I spent hours with this. I love this case, and it illustrates all of the things that we're talking about with specific instrument emphasis on the shape, the anatomy, maintaining the original anatomy, and maintaining that foramen as small as practical. It doesn't look like it here, but if you look carefully, the mesial root of this lower molar actually has three canals in it. Now let me go back and remember Sergio Cutler's study, and let's refer to it as a root canal system, but it's really not a, mesial can, a middle mesial canal. What it really is is a root canal system in the mesial root of a lower molar. But look at the webbing that's going on in the distal root. Look at, the, look at, the, look at that webbing without proper access without proper shaping, without proper irrigation, without proper activation of that irrigants, we're not going to capture that anatomy. 
sometimes in a seminar you'll hear somebody say, how much time do you spend doing a root canal? And you'll hear everything from the lowest is like 30 minutes to what I would do sometimes, multiple hours on a case. I don't know how that we can capture any of this anatomy without spending the ad adequate quality time to create ideal access, both radicular access and obviously pre predetermined before that, we've got to have good coronal access. Coronal access and then radicular access is key to creating the space necessary so that our irrigants can get in there, do what needs to be done in terms of debridement and disinfection so that we can have a clean system so that then we can operate the case. Here is, you've heard many people talk about, and I'm sure that many of you have seen them, both GPs and specialists alike. You've heard of C-shaped molars. This is a C-shaped molar that I've spent, I'm sure, at least two appointments, maybe three, and then operated this system exactly the same way that I have illustrated this entire webinar, using all of the things that I'm talking about in lots of patience and lots of time, and then we operated this system, and I can tell you, I can't tell you how much fun it is to see this illustrated on a computer screen when I'm done. I can't tell you why it excites me. I can tell you it does excite me, and I can tell you that this is, for me, a thrill of the fill. As we, as we change and as we think about our root canal systems, there's an emphasis today on conserving tooth structure. I think we all need to keep in mind that we need to be as conservative as possible with our anatomy of the, of the tooth whether it be dentin or enamel or whatever it is. We need to conserve tooth structure so that we don't predispose the teeth to radicular fracture. And so with that in mind, I'm trying to keep my entire root canal system and the shapes as conservative as possible. In this case, illustrates that. And there was a specific in emphasis while I was working on this case to keep it really small and to maintain the original anatomy but still capture those mechanical objectives and still capture that complex anatomy inside the root canal system of a lower second molar. I'm about ready to conclude for the, the evening. I appreciate the fact that you're all here, still with me, hopefully. It's uh, starting to get twilight here in Phoenix, actually in Scottsdale, and more specifically in uh, North Scottsdale. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, not letting our schooling interfere with our education. It means a lot of things to a lot of people, but to me, it means that no matter how much we know, there's so much that we don't know. And the more we are, have a thirst for knowledge, and the more we keep learning, the more we excited we are about what we're doing. With that in mind, I'm willing to answer any questions. I hope we have time for that. I think that one of our Tulsa representatives is going to illustrate some things that are available on the website. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for being here. I wish you all what I experience on a regular basis, the thrill of the fill. Thank you very much. Dr. McClamey, thank you. This is uh, John Crouch with Tulsa Dental. I'm the web content manager. Uh, with this being a recording, um, you will see several things on screen you can still make use of as you use this recording. A couple things I want to remind you of. All the web links of many of the things that you saw, including the interactive demo, are up in the upper left corner. The uh, email address in the bottom left is actually a hyperlink that if you want to send some questions towards Dr. McClamey or ourselves about anything, um, you can use that. And certainly the uh, quiz that you need to do CE credit, there's a download pod here. On the right you can use, you can also find that uh, and the course detail page of the website associated with this event. I do want to thank again Dr. McClamey for this project, which has been a pretty long enduring project, and it's, it's come off well because of his efforts on the uh, presentation, 
but also all the great images and the clinical video we were, we were able to show all of you tonight. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. McClammy, for all this great work. Um, and we have, I think all of us have probably enjoyed watching the uh, setting sun of Arizona go down on your webcam a little bit through the evening. So uh, we, I appreciate you for staying late this evening uh, and doing this in your extra hours. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Good night, all. Good night. Uh -oh.